All right, I'm gonna be covering this uh, chapter, and it's household dogs. So this is uh, the book by Raymond and Lorna Coppinger, Dogs. This book was a recommendation by one of my friends, um, and coincidentally, this was actually also a gift that I got as the guy was recommending the, the book. So this was a book, this was a gift that I got from a mother-in-law. Uh, she saw the title, but, uh, Dogs. She got it from me for Christmas or my birthday, which is right around the same time. And she just, you know, she just kind of gave it to me. And and I, I didn't really think much of it. I just put it on the shelf and it just collected dust for a little bit until this guy and I were talking. We have been talking about this book for a while and, and he was telling me how it was a little bit on the controversial side and I just kind of happened to look at the book and it was the book that he was actually talking about so the one chapter here that he um, that the book is really that I found really really interesting is this one right here uh, household dogs and I make this live because this might be a little bit of a long video and it's just going to uh, take too long to upload. So here, uh, you know, it says the, the third source of household dogs is where the problem begins to mount. This is where the householder captures a working dog for a pet. And then the absolute worst case scenario, the breeding of a working dog for the household pet market. Working dogs should not be pets. Working dogs should not be sold or purchased as pets, and working dogs should not be bred for the pet class of dogs. And the longer you are in this industry, the more you actually see this. You see a lot of working dogs be bred and sold as pets. I see this more and more the longer I'm in the industry. So I see this a lot, and all you have to do is look on Craigslist. Look on Craigslist, uh, go to your local shelter, go to your rescues, and you'll see the amount of working dogs that are advertised or rehomed as pets. And that's what I found. I find this particular chapter so intriguing because this whole chapter is so to the point and in your face that, you know, I like that style, which just pretty much tells you how it is, right? So it says, this is where household captures a working dog for a pet. And then the absolute worst case scenario, the breeding of a working dog for the household pet market. Working dogs should not be pets. So I'm just going to briefly read the highlighted stuff. And, uh, and probably just end it on that one. So uh, most working dogs are corrupted if not ruined. So most working dogs are corrupted if not ruined for their job if kept as pets. How can a livestock guardian dog protect livestock if it is in the house? Many working dogs transfer their socially developed protective behaviors in ways that make them dangerous to people. Right. If avoided, I avoided passing my guardian dogs onto people who didn't have livestock. Right. So he he keeps talking about this, uh, on and on for a little bit. But again, an, another thing that you see on a regular basis is working dogs that are not on there. So it just gets more and more interesting, more and more in your face the deeper you go into it. So perhaps the image evoked by working dog enhances i really like how he just puts it out on the table here you know perhaps the image evoked by working dog by the working dog enhances the owner's status or enables an association with other people who identify with the dog's heritage owning a hunting breed suggests that the owner might be a hunter or might know about hunting and be a self-reliant outdoors person uh, so he's pretty much telling you this is probably about status. And the deeper we go into this chapter, 
the more he points that out. Uh, and this is something that I, I strongly, again, strongly believe is that this is about status. I see people with working dogs that should not have working dogs. And not because I don't think they're worthy of having a working dog. I could not care less who has a working dog. But the problem is they're having these working dogs that don't do anything. They do absolutely nothing. But they're very proud of the fact that they own a working dog. You see them all prou proud. Like, oh, yeah, you know, I have, I have this dog or this dog. The popular now, especially in this area, is the Malinois. This, this breed is just turning into a pile of garbage because people are breeding indiscriminately and they're, they're homing, they're sending their dogs to just anybody who's willing to pay. And the quote unquote accidental breedings, like 80% of them are bullshit. They're not accidental. Some of them are, but I really don't believe that. I've heard of people that have you know, accidental breeding said that was no accident. You fucking, you expected that to happen. If it was an accident, goddamn, it was a happy accident for you. Right, so here's the big shift for dogs. No longer are they chosen for the way they behave, but for the way they look. Selection in the Darwinian sense is for their appearance. The benefit to the human is not in the innate behavioral abilities, but in the coat color, ear carriage, and size. But these are superficial traits related to survival only cosmetically. It is ironic that the village dog, well su suited to survive, is rejected as just a mutt for the same traits. All right, so what kind of dog should I get? This is in quotations, right? To enhance my status, round down my image, amuse me. This is basically what the average pet person is getting. All right. Um, so again, more um, really good information in this whole chapter, but I, I'm going to go to the parts that really intrigue me. So this other one right here says, you know, um, but in contrast, this policy and process with those of working dog breeders who created the breed in the first place, I'm horrified at what the hobby breeder has achieved. Breeders of working dogs did not attend dog shows to have their dogs judged on how they looked. They selected the best performers to breed dogs that were good workers. Most of them were not interested in perform in perfecting a breed. Um, as a sled dog driver, I wanted to win races. What the dog looked like was important only for how the shape could run. Ancestry was important only for what it could indicate about the dog's potential to run. Uh, a dog purchased for inbred stock, untested in the field for many generations, is the product of a breeding program, maybe, that has little to do with its working behavior. The expectation of the new owner is that the dog will be good because it is a purebred golden retriever. What kind of dog shall I get? Get a golden retriever because they have friendly nature and disposition, athletic ability, love of water, and natural instinct for hunting and retrieving. So he says, that sounds ridiculous to a working dog person or to a population gen geneticist. Friendly disposition is genetic. Love of water is genetic. Athletic ability has something to do with golden color. Is the implication that all golden retrievers have the same genes and all the traits? Is there no variation in golden retrievers? Lord Treatmouth, which is known to, he talks about him earlier in the book, he's known to have uh, the first golden retriever, uh, had good dogs because he had good breeding program that included a high percentage of cross breedings and because he hired people to work those dogs from their youngest days and develop the best dogs. Um, he liked the hunt. He liked to have the best hunting dogs and he was proud of his eye for working dogs and he called the bad ones. Anybody who ever created a breed did so by calling the ones they didn't want. 
So today's household golden retriever is a caricature of Lord Tootmouse dogs. The first rule of working dogs is they have to have stamina. Stamina is one result of genetic vitality, but stamina plus working behavior make for obnoxious pets. This is what he's saying. Your working dog, your average working dog should not be with a pet person. Right, so a little bit more on here, but I'm going to go right to this. Trying to select for an acceptable household behavior while holding the working shape constant cannot be done. The dog will come apart. It will show genetic disease. Its hips won't fit together right. The joints will show weakness and the dog will twitch and bleed. And each generation will become increasingly miserable. A list of breed specific genetic diseases are now part of national and popular literature. And it's worse than that. Breeders and owners forget the histor what the historical dog looked like. They select for the exaggerated form. They select for the really big ones. They select for the fattest face. They select for the longest face. The breeds end up with weird conformations. Each breed takes on a natural, unnatural shape, becoming a freak of nature. And by seeing some of the breeds today, that's very, very apparent. Uh, the dog is capriciously manipulated for human pleasure. The most bizarre and exaggerated animal is the most is the um, is the more <laughs> the more bizarre and exaggerated the animal is, the more benefit it seems to confer. This recent breeding fad. for purebred dogs is badly out of control. It appears that selection for the exotic is the goal, probably to increase interest in sales. We are producing unhealthy freaks to satisfy human, human whims. This is terribly unfair to the dog. So, Then, I mean, that's a lot, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end up with this one. So it says, the breeding programs are not concerned with adapting the dog to the household environment. Rather, the dog is being bred for its show place value and not some mere bagatelle of form with little concern for what's inside or even if the animal inside that aesthetic shape hurts. It's beast it's a bestial way to treat your best friend. Hundred percent agreed.